Uh, let's begin. Let's talk about the uh, third and final chapter of The Abolition of Man, titled The Abolition of Man. Um, as I mentioned, I believe I mentioned this uh, a couple of times in, in a few different contexts now, um, the, the reason for the odd naming convention of naming the third and final chapter the same as the book um, has to do with how this was published. This was originally a, uh, a series of talks that were given, uh, I believe radio addresses. Uh, and so before they were published into a book, they were individual separate lectures that he then compiled together, transcribed, wrote down, edited, and published as a book a year or so later. Uh, and so uh, in coming up with a title, uh, he basically just came up with, uh, well, the title of the third talk, which is just a line from the third chapter, which is uh, particularly relevant to the sort of thematics of what's going on. Um, it is notably far less relevant to the discussions of the first two chapters, which kind of lead into the discussion that we have in this one. Uh, and so the, the title, The Abolition of Man, may have seemed odd up until this point. Does it make sense now why it's called this and where he was going with all this? Okay. So overall, what did we think about this one? Easier or harder to read? Anything in here that, uh, that we want to look at or go over? Any difficulties? What would you think? Or just your overall thoughts? Okay. Okay, so where did you get lost? Was it right away? Was there somewhere you lost the track of things? Somewhere we can pick up and try and work on it. Kind of throughout. Like, I would understand the examples, but when they would start talking about other things, everything just kind of jumbled together. Okay. Um, partially, this is probably just an artifact of how he's, how he's writing. He is, he is pretty conversational here. Rather than being, you know, carefully going from step to step to step in a logical sequence. Um, and so a lot of that does involve going through uh, different, uh, different examples and just sort of jumping from one example to another and hoping that they pile together correctly in the listener's mind, which has its benefits. Because if it does happen to pile together correctly in your mind, then it clicks and everything works perfectly. But if it doesn't, then I can't blame you for being lost. Let's put it that way. Um, so what would you say, either, either you or anybody else, what would you say is his overall thesis for this chapter? What is this chapter trying to prove? Now, it might be a couple of different things, so let's see one thing. Try to, like, conquer nature. You're always going to be, like, under nature's power. You're always going to back to nature. Yeah, so if, uh, if you try to conquer nature completely, then the last step of that will wind up turning back in on itself, and you will effectively be conquered by nature. And by you here, who's he talking about? Human race. Man, mankind, the human race in general. Right? So he's not exactly talking about a particular person or even a particular group of people. What he's talking about is this sort of drive that we have to overcome the natural world and, uh, and sort of take it under our control and our dominion as a species. Right? We, we're, we're civilized people, more or less. We want to be civilized people, more or less. We want to, we want to cultivate society and keep ourselves as, as people as safe, as secure, and as prosperous as we can. All of those are, are well, I think Lewis would say, perfectly legitimate uh, goals, even under the Tao, under traditional morality. The problem, he thinks, comes with how we carry this out and what sorts of things we try to sort of conquer and what that ultimately means. So what else can we say about this? Uh, is that the, I don't, I, I, I don't think that's quite the only main thesis. That's, us, that's certainly like one of a couple of probably the most significant ones. What else is he arguing for here? Mm -hmm. That there's a few individuals who control the uh, tide of humanity mm -hmm. and make the big decisions. Yeah, so uh, this is another major theme that's throughout. It's that when we think of our power or capacity or capability as a species, usually we're not talking about something that everyone or anyone can do or can accomplish. What we're usually talking about is what some people can do and what they can allow other, people's, other people or peoples, either way, to do through that, through that power. And then probably more importantly or more fundamentally and definitely more dangerously, 
what power those people have over other people. Right? And that's what power is always going to be in this sort of human social context. Right? We don't really have, we as a species, right, as human beings as such, we don't really have power over nature. What we have are powers, things that we can accomplish, things that we can do. And usually what we are doing is to impact other people, positively and or negatively. Not usually positively. We, if we're talking about you know, our ability to interact as a society, these are usually positive impacts that we have on people. But this is the other, another major part of what he's, what he's talking about here in this chapter, that the question of whether we are positively or negatively impacting other people with these powers that we have that's something that makes perfect coherent sense under the Tao or traditional morality. But if we get rid of that, and if we try and start over and try and come up with a new basis for ethics, come up with a new ethical system, what does it mean to help or harm other people, to use these powers that we have for good or for bad or for, or for evil or for benefit or what? That's the other point here. So he talks throughout here, throughout the whole chapter, about uh, how there are these problems for, the, for these hypothetical conditioners, which we'll, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more as well. But um, the, the key point here is that these conditioners are the people who are, 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 well, the people who are like a Gaius and Titius, who he's, uh, in the way that he's talking about them in the, ch in the second chapter. Which you'll note, he doesn't mention them or the Green Book even once in this one, in this chapter, like at all. Because what he's doing here is he's taking this as one example. Right? The Green Book is one example of somebody doing something that he's talking about. And then he's gradually abstracting away from it to a bigger picture problem. Right? And the bigger picture problem is that the people who want to form sort of their own ethical system, in the way that we talked about Tuesday, right? Sort of picking up one part and making it significant or making it the most important, that sort of thing. Or just sweeping everything away entirely and starting and trying to start from scratch, whatever the case might be. The people who try and do this are, uh, are necessarily doing it in a way that is, uh, is affecting other people for some reason. The problem is that the, for some reason, whatever reason they might have, can't make, uh, can't be based upon the morality they've just debunked. Right? And because it can't be based on this morality that they've just debunked, well, it has to be based on something. And so to get to the previous point, and now we've gone in a circle, it has to be based purely upon nature in terms of just animal impulses, felt desire, instinct, if you want, that kind of thing. So that's the sort of three of those themes put together winds up making uh, sort of the, the central thesis or the central theses of, of, I think, this chapter and then ultimately of the book. Okay. Did that help, do you think, of sort of settling things together? Kind of. Still fair. Still fair. I, I understand. What else in here, in particular, do we want to do we want to look at? Either whether that's an example, a line of argument, uh, general thoughts about his about these claims that he's making. What do you think? Um, good question. So he's refer he refers to them as the conditioners. And now people in power here means specifically um, the group of people who have the most power over mankind, mankind as a species. Whatever group that might be, he speculates, he speculates here somewhere about uh, perhaps the 100th century AD right here, right? Where there will be a group, or a group or a generation of people who are most capable of uh, separating themselves away from the influences of the past, the influences of tradition. Right? 
of basically of doing this process that Gaius and Titius were trying to do, of debunking classical morality and trying to replace it with something of their own, something they think is more, uh, more rational, more, uh, more scientific, more efficient, whatever they want to call it. This is the group that is most capable of doing that. And then also simultaneously, most capable of conditioning or teaching, broadly speaking, their fellow men in their own generation and then subsequent generations um, this new mode or this new method of morality or ethics. And so conditioners, why they're called conditioners here is because they are, rather than teaching and educating in the classical sense, he makes this distinction uh, in the previous chapter between um, propagation and propaganda, right? between, uh, and he uses the, the example of a, uh, I think it's in this chapter, of a, uh, of the difference between uh, uh, older birds teaching young birds how to fly versus poultry keepers, so farmers, uh, raising chickens in a certain way that's conducive to them producing eggs and then growing up to be meat. There's a big difference there. And so what he says here is that the conditioners are not passing on what they have received, which is the traditional way of education. Right? I'm teaching you guys stuff that I have learned in roughly the same way, and I have sort of, maybe I've developed it on my own, but it's in this organic sort of way like you were talking about on Tuesday, right? That, that in order for me to go on to teach you, and for, or in order for you to go on to teach, whether that is in, edu in like formal education or even just explaining things to people around you or, uh, or raising children or whatever it might be, what you'll presumably be doing is taking the lessons that you have yourself internalized in this very way, in, in this way of sort of receiving it from, from posterity, and then passing it on as best you can. This is in contrast to how he call, the people he calls the conditioners will instead take a sort of abstract template. This is what I think that the next generation or the students or the future of humanity or whatever should be like for some reason. Now the reason gets confused, but that's for later. For whatever reason they might have, it doesn't matter for now. They think that we should make humanity into this. And they're going to condition them both psychologically, educationally, uh, and um, genetically even in a certain way. Now keep in mind, when he's talking about eugenics and genetics and all this stuff, he's writing in the early 40s. This was incredibly popular at the time and not just in Nazi Germany. He has that line that I mentioned last time, right? That, um, that this, uh, this process which will abolish man goes on apace um, in uh, not only in uh, Nazi Germany, but also um, among communists and Democrats no less than among fascists. Right? Part of that is because eugenics was incredibly popular. I don't know if, I don't know if this is common knowledge. I, I maybe think of it as common knowledge, but um, a lot of major institutions throughout Europe and the United States in the teens through 30s were all on board with eugenics, like sterilizing undesirable populations, whether voluntarily or not. Undesirable populations, depending on where you were, could be anything from, uh, anything from people who were not intelligent enough, people who were poor, people who were ethnic minorities, or not even ethnic minorities, but, um, but um, minority populations in a given context, that sort of thing. You might find different sorts of eugenics programs going on in different regions or different countries or that sort of thing. And all of this was not just you know, commonplace, but popular. Like A lot of people thought that this was the future of humanity. This is how we were going to make the next generation better. And you can, now, if you put yourself into this mindset, you can see how they might think this, that you know, if, you, if, you, if you sort of narrow your focus down, you want your children to be as best off as they possibly can be, or maybe not your children even, but the children that you care about, the next generation. You want them to be as best as they, uh, the best people they can be, have the most advantages they can possibly have. And so part of that is to, to 
uh, to have them be a certain way, meaning, well, if you know that they would, they, would, um, they would have certain disadvantages and you can get rid of those disadvantages, it's a good idea. Now, this, this obviously constructs all sorts of problems, and that's part of what he's pointing out here in the book. Uh, because he is, uh, he's addressing a very popular social trend of eugenics, basically. But it's not exclusively about eugenics either. This is about um, the way that we, we shape the next generations. And so why this group is called the, why he calls them the conditioners is because they are the ones who are most capable of fully and completely conditioning subsequent generations exactly how they see fit. So they're the ones who make the new template, this artificial DAO that he calls. And so they're conditioning not just the particular children in their society. Right? They're conditioning all subsequent generations because they have, as he says, a perfect applied psychology and perfected uh, genetic sciences such that they can make the subsequent generations exactly how they want to make them, who will then pass this on and continue this educational program. Because of course they will, because they've been conditioned to perfectly. Now maybe we can say that's implausible. Maybe it's the case that at some point, right, yeah, there will be outliers and people won't be perfect according to whatever this plan is. If history is any indicator, that's going to be the case. However, we're assuming by default that this is, first of all, far into the future. And if we follow trends of you know, the development of science, and if he's correct about this, part of that trend is an increasing uh, both ability and desire to mold the next generation according to, well, according to something, but something apart from what we've simply received. And the capability of doing it increasing as well, because we, we get more and more of an understanding of how these things are produced, both, again, through educational study and also through, uh, through uh, both applied psychology and psychiatry, like medication type stuff, genetic, uh, genetic analysis, um, all these sorts of things that can contribute to what he sees as making mankind what we want to make it man's power over ourselves, but ourselves here meaning the generations that come after. Okay, so that was a, that was a lot, but is that all fitting together or am I, uh, anything else I should add to that or anything about that unclear? What do you think? Yeah, I'm just I'm curious, what exactly is eugenics? Oh, eugenics, okay, oh yeah, good question. <laughs> I wish you'd said that like five minutes ago, that's a good point. Uh, so eugenics is uh, is the science of selective breeding. Um, of it, it's it's uh, it, it's originally a sort of uh, the kind of thing you would find in in agricultural animal animal husbandry that sort of thing, right? So if you want um, if you want to select for livestock that'll have certain qualities, say cattle that are more docile, then what you're going to do is you're going to breed the cattle that are more docile, and their subsequent generations are going to be more and more docile, and so they're not going to stampede, right? They're not going to um, you know, cause trouble on the farm, that sort of thing. They're going to have, um, uh, they're going to produce more milk or produce more meat or uh, anything else, right? So you selectively breed for a particular end or a particular goal. The eugenic science that developed in the, the sort of early 20th century was applying the same methodology to human beings. Allowing those people, allowing and encouraging those people to reproduce who, who have the most desirable traits. And either disallowing or discouraging, depending on where you were or what the context was, either disallowing or discouraging people from, from reproducing if they had less than desirable traits. Again, according to this whatever scheme that they were trying to implement. Not to, uh, not to simply uh, imply guilt by association, but uh, this was kind of the, the, a major goal of, uh, of the Nazi party. They wanted a, a, uh, a, a pure and superior uh, Aryan or Germanic race. 
who ironically looked nothing like Adolf Hitler, which I find, I find hilarious. He was short, stocky, not particularly muscular, dark hair and eyes, whereas he wanted, he basically wanted, you know, well, me. Um, not to associate myself with such things. But visually speaking, you know, the six foot one, blonde haired, blue eyed, uh, vaguely Germanic man is, is what he was aiming for. He would have, I mean, he would have loved me in terms of what I looked like, but I, I mean, thankfully, he would have disliked my ideas. Which is really a badge of honor. If, if Hitler would have not liked your ideas, I think, I think you're on the right track. Anyway, that aside, um, but that, that was basically what he was going for. He was going for a particular type of person. Right? He, well, not just he, but the Nazi party in general, this, this, this racial ideology. But it's not even necessarily racial. Um, in the US, it was far less racialized. It was to a degree and in some places, but it was far less racialized. It was more about um, eliminating what um, Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson, was a major advocate of, of eugenics. Um, and it was more about uh, what he referred to, what he and a lot of these people referred to as undesirables, uh, which wasn't necessarily a racial characteristic, but um, things, like, uh, things like genetic diseases, health characteristics, intelligence, like general intelligence or specific intelligence, things like that would be selected for, and then negatives would be selected against. Uh, and this is, this is why there was a significant push for um, semi-voluntary sterilization for, for example, um, people, with, uh, people with genetic diseases uh, or people with, uh, with um, things, like, uh, things like Down syndrome, uh, things like that. Which, I mean, to be fair, this is still happening in a lot of parts of the world and in a lot of even sort of Western civilized parts of the world we might think of, like we might not expect it. Um, where, where is it? There's a country in Scandinavia, and I forget which one, so I don't want to slander one that it isn't. But it's one of them. Um, somewhere roughly in Northern Europe and Scandinavia, um, which has a near zero uh, incidence of Down syndrome. Do you know how they've accomplished that? That's part of it. Um, they have an extensive uh, series of genetic screening and, uh, and uh, prenatal screening and such. And they will strongly encourage people with genetic markers for, uh, for Down syndrome uh, not to have children. They provide like government incentives for them not to have children. Uh, and those who do, and uh, if there's a de any you know, detected, um, detected or suspected Down syndrome um, in sort of prenatal screening, uh, they will heavily encourage abortion. And by heavily encourage, I mean it's fully government funded, uh, and if you choose not to, you receive no governmental assistance in a, in a country with mostly socialized healthcare. And, and of course, now their population is, is, is wonderful and, and have a very low incidence of Down syndrome, which Okay, if that's the way you want to go. Um, again, you can see the reasoning behind this, right? That it's a hard life, both for you and for and for you know to to have um, you know uh, profound mental disability is a is a hard life, it really is. We shouldn't discount that. And so you can see the reasoning for wanting to. Um, Wanting to help your population be better off. The trouble is, one, the artificiality of it. That you are sort of separating yourself as a sort of conditioner of society away from society as such and sort of picking and choosing what attributes to keep and to discard and that sort of thing. The kinds of issues that Lewis talks about. And then, of course, the coercive or semi-coercive methodology, which has some nasty flavor to it. Has anyone read The Giver? It, it's a good adaptation. It's actually a really good movie. Um, it's all about this. That, that is, 
it is not like straightforwardly adapted from Lewis, but it was inspired by it. Like the author includes C.S. Lewis in both this and uh, one of his novel. Uh, oh, the novel I mentioned, uh, Paralandria, um, one of his science fiction, one Lewis's science fiction novels, were were close inspirations for The Giver. Uh, and again, it's about the almost entirely about this sort of conditioning of subsequent generations of society. Read it again with this in mind, or, or watch it again. That takes less time. Um, unlike a lot of unlike a lot of novel adaptations, especially ones that are that are pretty deeply philosophical, I think that the the movie version did a did a good job. So I'm hesitant to say that a lot with a lot of books turned into movies, but it was a good one. So that give you a picture of what he's arguing against and why he's why he's arguing against it. I mean, again, from our perspective on history, right, us sitting here 100 years later, it's relatively easy for us to say, "What the hell were they thinking?" And that was obviously wrong. And why would a you know a couple of generations of of very intelligent and very powerful people have have thought this was a good idea? Well, they did, and. I don't think it would be very fair to say that we are all just better people than them. This is something that we're going to be going through quite a bit, the kind of the, the difficulty of seeing the faults in ourselves compared to the faults in something that's very different from ourselves. It's very easy to notice problems in the past. It's much harder to notice problems in the present, because we're in the present. We live here. We're involved in it. It's part of our lives. Making these kind of moral reforms, things like rejecting genetic or eugenics, not genetics. Genetics is fine. That's that's just the study of gene sequences. But rejecting genetic, gene, uh, eugenics. Why can't I say this? This has been a process that that took generations, the world over, and there's still temptations to it. So. It's the kind of thing where to notice these, to notice moral errors, will often require a, first of all, a, a um, it requires you to be settled well within a particular social context, your own, and then notice the flaws and contradictions and, and, uh, and shortcomings of it, again, from within, and then develop it that way. That's how eugenics was, was sort of relegated to the dustbin of history. That's how slavery was more or less relegated to the dustbin of history. Again, more or less, because it's still, there are still instances around the world. But that's how this sort of thing happens, is a kind of moral development from within of, people's, of, people, of more and more people gradually noticing that there is something wrong with, uh, with aspects of the society we've inherited, rather than, uh, rather than sort of trying to abstract yourself away from uh, your own moral perspective or your own cultural perspective and trying to sort of take a bird's eye view of it. Because if you take a bird's eye view of it, you might correct some errors, but you might also introduce other ones, and you don't have a particular guiding principle to know what to introduce and what to get rid of. Saving the world is hard. It's not something that you or I can do, like, you know, tomorrow. All right. What else? Either about anything we've already just been talking about, or anything else? Anything else to uh, to move on to in the text? What else do we think here? This eugenics angle, by the way, is why he uh, why he includes contraceptives here as one of the technologies that he points to. So if you recall, he's talking about three technologies from the start. Uh, he says, uh, let's consider three typical examples, the aeroplane, the wireless in radio, and the contraceptive. Uh, these three things still apply today, but we can expand them out, obviously, because technology has developed further. Aeroplanes here, he's talking about not only just in terms of transportation, but also in terms of warfare, because it has this dual purpose. Right? Airplanes have a civilian function and a military function. And separating those two is basically impossible. Right? If you have the technology, it can be used in either way. And that's part of what it means for something to be a technology, is that it is simply a power that can be used. And there's nothing about it that dictates whether it can be used for one purpose or another. It's just a general purpose technology. 
And so he's talking about transportation, but he's also talking about um, uh, about warfare. So we can look at you know warfare technology to today and also transportation technology today, both of which have developed extensively. But they're still along roughly the same trajectory. Right? Warfare technology is still used for us to kill each other. Transportation technology is still used for us to move from place to place and communicate with one another. And to trade and to and to, to help produce things and all these other wonderful, wonderful things. Not to discount it. There's still a lot of overlap between the two. The wireless, which was the cutting edge communications technology, like telecommunications technology at the time, um, being able to communicate to a whole lot of people at once and to to you know send out your thoughts to a mass audience was brand new at the time, and so is Twitter. Same thing. Right? This is the kind of thing that he's talking about. I think that that um, that. We can we can transfer a lot of these a lot of these cautions onto whatever new method of telecommunication we happen to find ourselves with, uh, and it be the same the same kind of double-edged sword. It has these rich benefits, it has these these significant dangers, and a lot of it comes down to understanding what it is, what it's for, who's using it, and for what. And that that's the more fundamental question than the technology itself, right? So you know. Ah, I've used the example of the flat Earth before, right? Have I talked about the flat Earth theory at all here in this class? Really? Okay. Well, here we go. Okay. So, some, I, I swear this is related. I, 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 this is related. I promise. Um, it'll all make sense. So, question: Why did uh, why did nobody want to fund Christopher Columbus's expedition in the late 15th century? Why did people tell him not to? go across the ocean to India. Yeah, right. So we all learned that, that everybody knew in 1490s that if you sail far enough east, you will fall off the edge. Because we're on a flat disk. In Columbus, this, this clever guy said, no, no, I think the world is round and we can go around and get to India instead of going around the Horn of Africa or instead of going over land. Right? Okay. That's entirely wrong. No one in the 15th century, literally no one thought the world was flat. The last like, actual scholar who ever, like in recorded history, the last scholar who wrote that the world was flat was Alexander Trismegistus in the first century AD. What, 2,000 years ago, 1,400 years before Columbus, no one has seriously put that, well, OK, last 20 years accepted. That, that's going to come back. And, and you know this, right? And this is painfully obvious because you personally can go observe the curvature of the Earth. If you, there's, there's a lake on campus. Go down to Lake Jovita. Lakes have this cool quality of being flat. There's not too much weather, right? So you stand by the edge of the lake. Run this cool little experiment. Look across at the other side of the lake and note the lowest thing that you can see by the edge of the lake. Like if there's a flagpole, great. That's perfect. But pick something. Pick something relatively tall. Note the lowest point on it that you can see. And then lie down against the ground and look at it again. You will see less of it. Not by much, but by a little bit. And that's because you, what you are seeing is the curvature of the Earth. If you have ever seen a horizon, you've seen the curvature of the Earth. Uneducated medieval peasants all knew that the world was round. Roman slaves knew that the world was round. This, is, this has never been a question like since this was an active academic discussion like 200 years before Socrates. Then it was settled, and everyone has always known since that the world is round. So why in the world do we think that people in the 15th century thought the world was flat? The conditions. Well, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a propaganda thing. Because we learned it in early education for reasons that uh, neither we nor our teachers even have any idea about. I do because I've studied the history of the phenomenon because I find this utterly fascinating. Um, I, I, find, I find it utterly fascinating when people have obviously false ideas because the question of why arises, right? Um, so part of the reason for this was, uh, was, was um, 
the propagation of what's called the Dark Ages myth. Um, the Dark Ages myth is the myth that there was what we call a dark age, where there was a significant loss of knowledge roughly between 500 and 1500. This was invented from whole cloth in the early 19th century, so like less than 200 years ago, um, by uh, some English and American scholars um, who had a chip on their shoulder about, uh, about the Catholic Church. They were Ang Anglican Episcopalian and wanted to say that there was this age of unreason that happened. And, and then the Renaissance happened and everyone started thinking again. I'm oversimplifying. But this was the trend in academia for like 100 years. And it's still the trend in elementary schools because they lag behind higher education in terms of like how to teach stuff. So we all learned in history class in, in I don't know, second grade or whatever, that everybody thought the world was flat and then, you know, then explorers started sailing over the ocean and then realized, oh, wow, it's round. Um, the real reason everyone told Columbus not to sail across the ocean to get to India was because they thought it was too far and they were right. Because Columbus thought the world was significantly smaller than it actually is because we, we sort of as an, as an academic community of humans have known roughly the diameter of the earth and the circumference of the earth since the third century BC uh, when there was an Egyptian scholar whose name I can't remember at the moment, I wasn't prepared for this, um, who measured the circumference of the earth to within 1% of what we know it is today using shadows. Because you can, you can observe the, the, um, the difference of height given the angle of the sun than you would expect it to be. And so you can measure the angle of the curvature of the earth and you can extrapolate the circumference and he got it to within 1% of the correct number. Columbus thought that can't be right. <laughs> There's no way. It's got to be shorter than that. Because, you know, it only, it, it's just got to be, right? And so he decides he's going to sail across the ocean and would have died if he hadn't run into a continent. Because he would have starved because he didn't have supplies to get that far. So that's why nobody wanted to fund him. Yeah. Oh, he's trying to get to India, and he probably would have. Like, if you extrapolate a line going from Spain through the Caribbean where he, where he, where he managed to find land, if you keep that line going, he would have probably hit the southern, the southern tip of India. He had that part right, somehow. But um, what he didn't have right was the sheer distance involved. If he hadn't run into, uh, well, technically not a continent, a series of islands. Uh, yeah, the West Indies. They're so-called West Indies. That's why they're called that, by the way. West Indies. The, some of the islands in the Caribbean are called the West Indies for that reason. Some of the islands in the Caribbean are called the West Indies because Columbus thought he had landed in India and the name caught on. Everyone knew he was wrong very shortly afterwards, but the name caught on and so it, it stuck. And that's why it's called the West Indies because it's like, haha, we thought it was India, but it's not. It's in the other hemisphere, so it's funny. Right? You gotta name things somehow, right? I'm wildly oversimplifying this. Because remember, it's in that gap of my knowledge of history. I've said before, I know history quite well, uh, except for a large gap between 1277 and 1977. Right. 1277 is kind of the last thing I remember in terms of careful historical like dates and such. Because I remember um, there's, a there's a condemnation of various neo-Aristotelian propositions following on uh, from Thomas Aquinas that went too far, uh, condemned by the, uh, the Bishop of Paris at the time for, for all sorts of reasons. Fascinating thing. Uh, that's why it is officially Catholic doctrine, not dogma, but doctrine, uh, that aliens are possible. Um, that was part of that condemnation. Um, to, to clarify, it was condemned. The proposition condemned was that it is impossible for God to have created life on other worlds. So it is possible. Aliens could exist. Um, and then 1977 is the first Star Wars movie, and then I remember history again. There's a gap there that I'm kind of hazy about. But anyway, all this relates back to what we were talking about, because suddenly, 15, 20 years ago, people started believing that the world was flat again. And now, today, in the year of our Lord, 2023, there's a not insignificant portion of the population, probably more people numerically than have ever believed the world was flat, ever. Like, not by percentage, but by sheer numbers, just because our population's huge. There are probably more people today who believe the world is flat than ever have before, despite it being obviously false and disprovable by going and lying down by a lake. 
How is this possible? How did so many of us get so dumb so suddenly? I wouldn't actually blame them this time. Good guess, though. <laughs> Good guess. What were we just talking about when I said I prom right before I said I promise this is relevant? Yeah. One in particular. Telecommunications, right? Ah, advances in communications technology and the double-edged sword that that brings. So yes, we're capable of communicating with each other. We're capable of finding out new information, learning more than we ever could before. This was true with respect to the radio in Lewis's day. This is true with respect to social media today. But the other aspect of it is things like propaganda. Now, I'm not saying there's a propagandistic outlet saying that the world is flat. I don't. I don't think that I'm almost, that is probably not the case. Reasonably certain that's not the case. However, there is this cool little phenomenon um, associated with social media. Uh, so let me put it this way. Suppose in 1944, when this was published, suppose you got into your head for some reason to think that the world was flat. What would you do with that information? I bet you're right. And then they would all think you're crazy and tell you to stop drinking, right? right? I mean, like realistically, right? You'd start, you'd, you'd go and you'd tell your friends, hey guys, I think they're lying to us. I think the world is really flat and we're living, living on a flat disk. And, uh, and if you go too far in one direction that you'll fall over the edge and that's what the, the polar ice cap is. It's an, it's an ice, or the, I guess it's the Antarctic ice cap is what they think, right? It's, the, it's, it's like an ice wall around the edge of the world, right? And so that, so, uh, this is why, for instance, that if you fly from, uh, if you fly in what looks like a straight line, it doesn't look like a straight line on certain like map projections because you go over the pole and so it, it's really a straight line if you look at it on a flat disk, yada, yada, yada. Right? You have ideas, you think you're right. And then your friends will say, no, you're insane. <laughs> and they will take you somewhere and say, hey, look, look, do you see the horizon? <laughs> or they'll just treat you dismissively and they won't take you seriously. But if you're really set on it, if you're really hell-bent on it, maybe you'll, I don't know, try and find like-minded people. Right? Where would you go about finding like-minded people? In Dade City, Florida in 1944. <laughs> Nowhere, right? So, okay, fine, let's make it easier. Suppose you're in New York City in 1944. It's like, I, I gotta find more people who might, who might think I'm onto something here. How do you find people? Okay, fine, you ask around at the library and everyone thinks you're ridiculous and stupid. Maybe, if you're really lucky, you find like one, two, maybe three other people who might be open to, the sim to similar ideas. Even in like a metropolis night like New York. Hell, let's, let's be generous. Let's say you find like a dozen people. Then there's this group of you weirdos who no one takes seriously, who meets in like some deli shop's basement uh, like once a week and talks about the world being flat, and then your error goes, do excuse me, goes nowhere further. Okay. So no one thinks, no one agrees with you, obviously, and this doesn't spread like wildfire. Okay, fast forward 80 years. What do you do, let's say, when this, when this really took off in like, let's say 2004? In like 2004, if you thought the world was flat, then what do you do? Internet, you Google it, you find a chat room, you find a blog, you find, whatever, and you immediately find hundreds of like-minded people who can all sort of self-reinforce this crazy, obviously false idea. Cool, huh? The reason for this is because now, now instead of finding people to talk to who are just organically around you, you have constructed your own artificial community who are all a community because of a particular error that they share, and so nobody's going to be there to correct the error, right? So there is this real, okay, all this is to say that there is this, this sort of real danger to, first of all, new technologies, good as they may be, there is going to be a danger to it. 
and, and it's almost impossible to know what that danger will be until it's widespread and implemented and everyone uses it. And then also, there's a sort of danger to this artificiality of community that we should think about. Right? To, to try and construct a community with a particular purpose other than being people interacting, yeah, it's going to work for that purpose in particular, but you've got to be careful about what that purpose is and why you're implementing a community for that purpose because that might go horribly wrong. Okay. I got on a tangent there, but I hopefully, hopefully again, we, we managed to uh, we illustrate something useful, maybe. Finally, why, again, so going back to what I was uh, talking about earlier, why the contraceptive is because he's talking about this in terms of, um, in terms of how it affects subsequent generations, okay. whether that's deliberately or not, right? Um, whether that is on a, um, on a coordinated social scale or not. It certainly affects subsequent generations because different people are going to have different numbers of children because of their use or disuse or not use or whatever uh, of contraceptive technology. Right. And if we carefully apply that knowledge, well, then we are starting to get into the realm of eugenics where we, we, a particular generation and group of people, are shaping subsequent generations how we want to shape them. Now, if we're doing so according to traditional notions of morality, then it's not, it's by, almost by definition, it's not going to involve a kind of um, selective breeding type of thing. Because right? there, there are other norms in traditional morality which wind up contradicting that. Rather, what we'll wind up doing is either, um, how do we put this? What we, what, we in, what we in fact wind up doing is either abandoning traditional morality and just going the eugenics route like, like Lewis is talking about, or uh, we wind up going further into what Lewis is talking about and, and taking the, uh, what, he, what, he, uh, the, what he calls natural impulse right, as our guiding principle because we have, uh, we've used this technology to separate our actions from their, from their sort of natural consequences. And so by conquering this nature, this aspect of nature, what we wind up doing is we, we allow ourselves to treat sexuality as something merely natural rather than as something that is you know, intrinsically human and intrinsically social. And so what winds up happening is our, our, um, this particular aspect of our lives and our society becomes merely natural. Natural in terms of naturalistic, like he's talking about. Unguided, undirected, and simply guided by something like impulse or felt desire. Right? And so that's just sort of a micro scale example of this kind of thing, right? So that's applied to only one narrow aspect of our moral lives or our social lives or our human lives, uh, rather than, you know, rather than having to speculate ab about the 100th century and, and people conditioning all of mankind kind of thing. Yeah, so where was that? Um, really? No? Okay. Um, okay, well, fine. This document doesn't feel like being searchable today. But I wish I could find what you're talking about because, yeah, that was a, that was a really good point that he made. And um, I want to find the exact passage. Um, Was it dogmatic? Was that right there? I think it was, but. This is where he's, where he's talking about, as I look for it, um, he's talking about how um, upon sort of exiting the Tao, exiting, sort of extracting oneself away from traditional morality, what winds up happening is you lose any way of, I mean, this relates to what we were talking about Tuesday, you lose any way of justifying uh, what actions you are trying to do, right? And so that means that um, 
within the DAO, within traditional morality, there are reasons to follow and reasons to lead that are not mere power relationships. Right? There are reasons to, to accept someone's rule over you in particular contexts. Take, for example, this. What, what is happening right now? There's a reason right, that you all kind of listen to things that I have to say. Right? And it's not because otherwise I will do bad things to you. Because right? no, right? There, there are people who are not here today. I would like for you to be here, and I thank you for being here, and it's wonderful that you, you know, attend class and whatnot and pay attention and follow along, all, the, all these student things that you are doing. But as you know, if you don't do that, I don't mark off for you missing class. Now, that might differ from class to class, but in this particular example, right, the, the fact that you sort of follow the class structure, that you follow the lead of, uh, of me as, uh, as instructor and you as student is because of a certain relationship that you have entered into here of, of teacher-student, of uh, that you agree to do certain things, not even for me, but in a particular context, in the hopes that it'll help you learn, because that is, that is sort of a cooperation with what's going on. Right? It's not a cooperation with me in particular. Right? Yes, you do things that I tell you to do in some cases. Right? I give you assignments and you do them. Cool. But it's not that you're just obeying me or following me. You're following a particular model of behavior and a structure of how things are done in order to accomplish something. This is a sort of subset of what Lewis thinks of as the Tao. That you, you willingly and voluntarily and, and, uh, and deliberately will submit yourself, in a sense, to, uh, to structures of, above yourself. You'll submit yourselves to what somebody else will say or will, will ask for or even will command, not because it's them, but because of the relationship, the abstract relationship that you bear to them. Right? It's not like there's something special about me that makes me particularly worthy of your obedience, right? especially not in general. If I ask you to do the homework, that's one thing. If I ask you to go get me some more coffee, that's something else entirely. Right? Those are, that is, in other words, outside this particular context, right? the appropriate social context. It might even be inappropriate for me to ask, and to do so would disrupt that social context, social context of what's going on. Right. Now, I don't know about that, but I'm not going to anyway. But so what we see going on here, in, what we see with his argument is that if you sort of take yourself out of traditional morality or the Tao, what you wind up with is the only justification being what you can get away with doing, or what you happen to want to do. And if you are, and if you are forced to do something, if something is imposed upon you that you don't happen to want to do, then there's no reason for that aside from raw power relationships between someone's making you do it, and if you don't, bad things will happen to you, imposed by the person making you do it. And so there's a huge difference there between you know, uh, voluntary and rational obedience or rulership or whatever, any, or, or these, kinds of inter these kinds of social interrelationships, versus, uh, versus what the conditioners would then be doing which is a kind of imposition of their own will, their own arbitrary will, upon the conditioned. Where was that? I wish I could find the passage. Still can't. Thoughts on that or anything else we want to look at in here? Yeah. Did he ever explain why he used the word Tao? Oh, yeah, in the second chapter primarily. Right? 
Um, he uses it as a sort of catch-all term for what he thinks of as traditional morality, which is kind of cross-cultural. Uh, he uses the, the particular Chinese term Dao um, because it refers to a, within Taoism, a particular, a particular Chinese philosophy, it is a, um, it's an understanding of, of reality structured along certain lines and structured in certain ways, both reality being both human, natural, uh, and everything in between, or the social. And so the Tao is, is what he um, literally means the way. So the way to do things within, uh, within the world you find yourself in. And he just sort of takes that name for it and just sort of says, yeah, what I mean by the Tao is not just what Taoism means by it, but also that and what all of these various societies um, more or less agree on is how we ought to act in terms of terms of uh, sort of traditional uh, general morality. Uh, near the end of the book, there is a, uh, there's a section on this where he goes through yeah, appendix, illustrations of the Tao, and he goes through several of these precepts and he looks to different, um, different societies throughout, throughout the world and throughout history, and he says, here's what a bunch of them have to say on these similar topics and sort of noting the similarities. Um, he doesn't go through noting the differences, and there are some. Uh, but in, in the second chapter, if you recall, when he goes through uh, looking at what this traditional morality might be, when he points to differences, it's more of a difference in degree, should we go further or should we not go further, rather than it being a fundamental difference in kind. What are our fundamental motivations? That kind of thing. Does that make sense? Uh, one thing I want to note is this section about what he means by nature. Oh, something else? Yeah. No? OK. Oh, sorry. That happens. I, I as, as a teacher, I am trained to assume any motion is inquisitive. I'm basically a T-Rex. Anyway, um, so when he talks about what we mean by nature in this particular context, what he's talking about is a particular sort of post-enlightenment idea of nature as opposed to all of these different things that he lists, right? So he talks about nature as opposed to artificial, or natural as opposed to artificial, civil, human, spiritual, and supernatural. He sets aside artificial, because that just means like natural, like the difference between, if you go to the grocery store and you find something that is all natural uh, as opposed to something that is genetically modified, that's that first distinction. And he kind of wants to set that aside because that's not super relevant. Uh, but the rest of them, uh, he says, uh, I think we can get a rough idea of what men have meant by nature and what it is they oppose to her. He says, nature seems to be the spatial and temporal, so space and time, here and now, particular, as distinct from what is less fully so or not so at all. So the, so the eternal, things that span across time, and things that are not particularized material here and now in a place. So general, not specific. He says, he, she seems to be the, word of, uh, the world of quantity as against the world of quality. So countable particular things as opposed to qualitative characteristics, uh, uh, things that are, are abstractly capable of describing things in general. Uh, of objects as against consciousness. So you can think of something as, as conscious, or you can think of something as a simple object. Um, it's the difference between meeting someone and using them, if we want to put it in a particular like human social context. You can think of what it would mean, using someone. Right? It's, it's the difference between how you might think of, maybe this is going to be a bit, accu a bit accusatory, but uh, it's the difference between how you might interact with the cashier at that grocery store we were talking about versus you know, your friend who you're meeting for lunch. And they might even be the same person. Right? If you, if you typically, well, think of it this way. Uh, you use a customer service voice, which is different from, a, uh, from a, an interpersonal, like, hanging out with friends voice. It's because you're acting as part of their, part of the natural world to them, rather than as another person you're interacting with as a person. It's very different. 
He says, as the bound, so natural is what is bound, as against the wholly or partially autonomous. So bound by series of causes and, causes and effects, things that just happen the way that they happen, as opposed to things which could be different. That one is something to keep in mind uh, when we read some passages from uh, Anselm of Canterbury, um, 11th century, uh, who makes this distinction even, sh even more sharply between uh, what he calls the natural and the spontaneous. In other words, what things do and what people do. Uh, of that which knows no values, as again, that which both has and perceives value. So again, this is that fact-value dichotomy that, we, uh, that I briefly touched on near the end of Tuesday. I believe it was near the end. And he says, of efficient causes, or in some modern systems, no causality at all, as against final causes. So what, that one, that last one, what is, I think is this one I think is crucial. What's the difference between, again, an efficient cause and a final cause? Think back to on Tuesday when I was talking about why my coffee is hot. What does that mean? What's the difference between an efficient cause and a final cause? What's he talking about? The example I used to illustrate this difference on Tuesday was, what, was why is my coffee hot? And there's two radically different answers you can give to that kind of a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I want it to be hot. Because I want to drink it in a at a particular temperature because coffee is, is best when it's, let's say, either, to, to use the same example as I did before, either hot or iced and not just in the middle at room temperature. Right. Okay, That's what he means by a final cause. Terminology goes back to Aristotle. Final cause meaning the end or the goal towards which something is striving. What, the, what explains why something is the case in that it's sort of pointing towards that, uh, that final cause. This is very different from an efficient cause, which is just what put it into a particular configuration. The coffee's hot because I heated it up this morning to make it. It's kept hot because the thermos is insulated. Right? This is keeping it hot. Yeah, but it's kept hot because I want to drink it while it's hot, not cold or not cool or not somewhere in the middle. And so what he wants to oppose here is thinking of efficient causes, things that just put something into their particular place as, um, as something like natural. And thinking of things primarily in terms of their efficient causes of what structured it that way or what put it into its configuration or what made the thing as talking about nature. Whereas uh, the, 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 what is not natural or beyond nature is what it's for its purpose. And we can think about these things in, again, radically different ways. And we can think of the same things in radically different ways. Because we can think of uh, a tree, for example, as a natural object, as an object of nature, and think of it in terms of it growing a certain way due to its uh, you know, weather conditions, soil, uh, soil conditions, and uh, and the, the, the sort of genetic structure of the seed or something like that. But that's just sort of what, what causes it to grow. Water, sun, soil, etc. But then we can think of it beyond, in a way beyond that. We can think of it in terms of its human purpose. Why is the tree in a particular location? If you look at any of the trees out on this campus, they are where, they're, where they are for very particular reasons. And it's not just because they happen to be there. Because they are kept there, they are pruned there, they are, they are maintained. They are not natural in the sense that they are human. They're there for human reasons. We have ends, goals, final causes that we impose upon them. Beauty, direct, uh, beauty shade, decoration, uh, uh, you know, um, oxygen, natural greenery, whatever. Right? Ask a landscaper why that tree is there. They'll give you a reason for it. But then also, they might have their own intrinsic final causes. The tree grows to be a tree, not to be made of wood, not to be grown from a seed, not to take in nutrients, but to be a particular kind of tree. And to flourish, to grow as a tree grows, 
thinking of it as a sort of organism, as as uh, as its own creature rather than just as an an item, as a thing that's just sort of there. And so I think that is a great distinction to make because as he goes on, he starts talking about um, why the conditioners, those who reject the Tao and traditional morality, would have no basis for coming up with a new reason, uh, a new moral structure to, to condition. They would have no particular reason aside from impulse. And it's because what they have done by deconstructing and taking apart the Tao is they've rejected final causality. They've rejected what is fundamentally are the reasons we can give for why we do things. And instead, what they, rely, what they simply rely on is efficient causality. I do this because I want to just means there's a particular structure going on in my head or, and or mind that makes this seem appealing to me, whatever this might be. Right? Conditioning people in a certain way or having a sandwich. I have a sandwich because my stomach feels, hung, feels empty and it's growling at me. That's an efficient cause, right? It's not talking about I have a sandwich because I want to be a certain way. I want to have this kind of a sandwich because it's healthier. Uh, and I want to have a sandwich at lunchtime because it's appropriate in a social context to eat at lunch, not at you know, 3, 3 p.m. Things like that are unnatural in this sense. They, are, they go beyond the mere nature. They go beyond mere efficient causes into final causes, into purposes, into human purposes. But if you kind of cut all of that off by debunking the, the sort of traditional structure of morality, then what do you have? Well, all you have is mere impulse, mere nature, mere efficient causality, things that are pushing you towards doing something, not, not providing a goal that you want to strive towards. And without a goal to strive towards, your reasons are arbitrary. Your reasons for doing anything, let alone imposing some new moral framework. So I think, again, I think that that is that one there, that, that efficient versus final causes, I think a, a, a brilliant illustration of the kind of distinction that he wants to make. Now worth noting, worth noting, like a lot of the distinctions he makes here and a lot of the criticisms he's presenting, this is realistically only a criticism of the worldview of somebody like Gaius Antitius, the, the emotivist, the one who is, who is dismissing or debunking the traditional notion of morality. This distinction between natural and its opposite misses some things, because there are other ways we can mean natural, which we'll talk about next week. Uh, because this is really the way that, that modern people, and by modern I mean like enlightenment going forward, think of the word natural, as opposed to artificial or human or supernatural. So this is, this is something to keep in mind that starting next week, roughly, we're going to be using natural in an additional way that we're going to have to look at and what it means and why. So keep that in mind, again, as you're reading, as you're reading moving forward. But it's something to note that this is really an internal criticism of the, the sort of emotivist or green book view of why their view of natural falls apart. It doesn't, it doesn't sustain a, a new ethical theory. That was probably important to note just because, again, moving forward, we're going to be looking at things, and again, other, other ways in addition to this, that if this is the, the particular framework of natural that you've got in mind, it might make things confusing going on. So last thing I want to mention, and this is an historical note that he does talk about a little bit that I find, again, fascinating because it's a portion of history that I find fascinating, um, where he talks about uh, this relationship between magic and science. Anybody notice this or make note of this or find this interesting as well? Um, yeah, he says, yeah, here. He's talking about the magician's bargain. I'm talking about Faust, where, um, you know, selling your soul to achieve power, which is kind of how he sees this kind of, this, this kind of moral innovation. But what's interesting about this is that, uh, is that uh, he, he brings up the historical anomaly of thinking of magic as being ancient rather than modern. But he says, um, 
You'll find people who write about the 16th century as if magic were a medieval survival and science the new thing that came in to sweep it away. Those who have studied the period know better. I've studied the period. Well, I've studied the period before this. Um, there was very little magic in the Middle Ages. The 16th and 17th centuries were the high noon of magic. The serious magical endeavor and the serious scientific endeavor are twins. One was sickly and died, the other strong and throve. But they were twins. They're born of the same impulse, um, et cetera, et cetera. So science, as we know it, modern science of, the, of, of analyzing things by taking them apart, seeing how they work, and then using that knowledge to create things of our own. The, thing, the things we see as this sort of feedback loop between science, right, the theoretical sciences, and the applied sciences, so science and engineering, broadly speaking. That was a 16th century thing, 15th, 16th-ish, something like that. And so was magic, as we think of it today as kind of a, as a sort of esoteric way of, of resting control of reality, of the, of the arcane forces of things, the kind of things that we see in like fantasy literature. That is exactly the same kind of thing as applied science that arose again in the early modern period. Again, before that, what you would find was things that we would think of perhaps as magical, things like alchemy, right? things like, um, things like you know, studying things that we think of as supernatural, like understanding, uh, understanding angels or spirits or things like that. A lot of that existed, but it was, it was seeking an understanding of it to try and figure out how we fit into that world, whether that is the natural world or the supernatural world, if you can draw such a distinction, rather than how can I understand this such that I can manipulate it for my own or society's purposes. That was a major shift. And so he, sat, and so he points out all of these things about, well, the, the, the study of magic and the study of early science were all having to do with the achievement of human power over nature, right? man's power over nature, rather than being about the accumulation of knowledge and wisdom. Yeah, sure, we do all that, but it's for a further purpose. He, um, he quotes uh, Bacon, I think it was. Yeah, he condemns the use, uh, he, uh, Sir Francis Bacon, condemns those who value knowledge as an end in itself. This for him is to use as a mistress for pleasure what ought to be a spouse for fruit. 